see what's going on. What's actually doing? I use this freaking camera again. I can't play that. Something around here. Let's see what's happening. I can't put the camera in the machine. Let's try and see if we can get outside of it. It's pretty simple. Actually, we're trying to pull it out. What's the machine? That's a probing cycle. All right, I want to go over the programming of this a little bit. Let me switch to the Numroto software in this machine. This is the this is what we used to what I used to program. Get a little bit wider view. I don't have a screen capture software on this computer, or I could make a little bit better presentation of this. But basically, what it what we do is we define the geometry in. A, well, let me go back here one more. I'm, I'm not going to start a new program because I want to grind one more tool here, but you go over here and you select step drills. I have these four modules, I guess you would say, that um, software modules in my control. Uh, end mills, form cutters, step drills, and, and uh, burrs. Although I've never ground a burr before, but I could do it technically. And so for this one, you'd select the step drill, and then you'd say new here. And I'm gonna close this for right now. And so basically what you would be getting to is the geometry part of the thing here. So you would define the point. Um, well, let me go back one more. Excuse me, I should have shown you this. Step drills, if I, if I say new here, um, and I say resharpening, then I get this selection of different points I can do. And this particular point I'm doing is an M6, uh, they call it. And all the ones that I, I have a selection for, I can do, and these ones that don't have a selection are different software that I don't have. So I can do a spiral point, four facet, S4, just kind of like a, a drill with no, a multiple clearances s6 m6 these two are are almost identical as far as i can tell or you can do a three point type of a a point um you know a beak type or, or this is like a woodworking drills are ground this way sometimes and that regular end mill tip and a countersink and this kind of uh split point that kind of split point and this kind of a split point. So this is the one I'm doing right here on this particular thing. So I'm gonna cancel that, I'm gonna cancel all of this. Um, close. I'm gonna go back to my uh, drill I had here. So that, that takes us to this geometry part of it. So I define the point. You can see this is an M6 point. Now define the angle, which is 140 degrees. I'm not m modifying the point length. In this case, I do that in the grinding cycle. And then there's just one step on this drill. So that's basically all, all the, all the de definition of the point there is for this um, grinding. And then, then you gotta define the helix, the number of flutes, which this is just a standard drill. So it's two flutes, helical flute, and the, uh, um, lead i actually probed this on the first one i ground so it ended up that it measured it but i usually just set like 30 degrees in here and then i probe the the actual helix angle on there and, and the core diameter i just leave these as default down here these work pretty good although i did probe this so it might have changed this i, I didn't see the original default values and then it's a right hand tool right hand cutting direction and there's no taper so that's the you could have multiple steps here. You could you could add them, you know, like a like a step drill that has a face, like a counter boring tool or different angles or whatever. This one only has one step, of course, because I'm just grinding the tip of it. Okay, and that's a division that I actually probed this and it came up with this division of 179.2603 degrees. You're gonna see the probing cycle. So you can kind of see what happens with that. The blank, I, I didn't really define any of this because it's not necessary for regrinding. So that's the um, that's the actual geometry of the tool which you select up here. I don't know if you can see that or not. Maybe you can't see that. Right, right up here. 
And then the machining aspect of this, this is the projection out from the, um, well, I, I actually ought to go back to the geometry a little bit here because I had, I had the length here, which is, um, if I go into the step, I had the length, the diameter of the tool and the length defined as inch and a half here. And that, that I mostly do when I'm regrinding a tool for the purpose of probing the helix. So it's gonna come up the tool about an inch and a half to probe the helix. Um, if you were grinding the flutes and everything, you would need to put the right length and all that in here, but for the purpose of probing, I don't want it to go all the way down the tool to probe the helix angle, just enough to get a good angle on the tool. So that's why I've got it that way. And um, the rest of this, you know, if you have a chamfer or not, this doesn't, of course, and um, a taper to the tool. There's, if I was manufacturing a drill, it'd be putting in more features into the grinding steps as far as the fluting and, the, and backing off this clearance on the, um, behind the cutting edge of the drill as you see on normal drills, but I'm not doing that. I'm just sharpening the point. So that's, that's what that is. And that has to do with why this picture kind of looks funny because the, the, I've got this collet chuck in the middle here. And so my drill is sticking out from the end of the collet 6.3 inches. That's what this dimension is. And the collet chuck itself, I know is 5.8 inches long from the face of the spindle. So that's that, that number there. And this is important so that it doesn't collide with the probe when you first probe it, of course, because it knows kind of where it is. It's gonna establish the actual length when it probes it, but you need to have a rough length here. I, I just scale this by eye and put it in there. And uh, these are gonna be some of the feed rates, the rapid feed rate when it's doing various things. And all of this stuff really doesn't, I don't even play with this at all. I just leave the default values because it works good just like that. So that's, that's the actual programming of the tool. You know, you can actually adjust all of these cycles and stuff for different clearance angles and everything, but I pretty much just leave the default settings here because they work pretty good for just regrinding a normal tool, all of these. But you have many, many settings you could go through here and adjust a lot of different stuff here. The, you know, on, like on this gash or split point, you could define the radius. It, it, it comes out and, and all of this stuff. It's in a rounding radius, rounding angle, rake, everything. You could, you had a lot of adjustments here, but I have found that just the default angles pretty much work the way you, sh you need them to. It's pretty simple. That's really all there is to it. Uh, there, you can even run a 3D simulation here, but this won't make sense. I could probably display it. See, because there's no flutes to the tool, so it won't really, I mean, I could run it here and you could see it. Actually, if I show the machine view, it'd probably be, see, it thinks it's getting a collision already because there's no flutes in the tool. Let's see if it'll run through it, if I can force the... So that's the, that's the point that it's... But like I said, it got a collision because there's no flutes on the tool, but that's the point it's grinding right there. So that's as easy as that to do. It's not really... If you, um, if you want it to really be have a nice simulation, you could model the tool within an STL file and import it in as the, as the um, stock, if you will. So you can bring an STL blank in. Or you could actually put the grinding cycles in there and do it and then not run it. It's just a lot more work. I don't usually do it. In fact, I normally don't even run that simulation at all when I'm regrinding a tip of a drill because it's not really necessary. You notice that the rotation of the of the grinding wheel changes. It's rotating this way for the gash out, and and the other direction for the the um, actual cutting of the cutting edges or the reliefs and stuff. 
so that the, the grinding wheel is, is grinding in toward the cutting edges, not away from them where it could chip the cutting edge. So that's the that's basically all there is to the to the programming. And then we're gonna um, I'm gonna probe the grinding wheel just so it's in the video so you can see it. But I don't normally have to do that if it's been probed before. And then uh, we'll probe the tool and then we'll grind the tool. All right, as to the actual grinding, first we have to configure this uh, to tell it that grinding wheel pack is in the spindle, which I've already done. And then we go over here to sharpening and we select this. Now here's something we have to make a few adjustments on. You can actually edit all your geometry here too in this uh, window that comes up. As you see, it's, all, it's the same as the programming part of it in this part of it. But what, what we're really interested here for the grinding aspect of it is the stock removal. Now, I've, I've added a pass to this gashing because I decided with this big chip in the end of this drill, I need to take about maybe 60 thousandths off the length, the length of the tool here. And so I've, I've stepped this up to 60 thousandths and I told, I told it I want to make two passes. Normally it would just make one for the um, gash or the split point, but I told it to make two and take 30 thousandths per pass just to be a, I, I've got this thing sticking out in this collet chuck you'll see here and and uh, it's kind of and not the strongest setup in the world I don't have a lot of these special swablin collets for the uh, to uh, hold all these different size drills so I put it in this ER 32 collet and uh, it's, so it's not that strong so I didn't want to just take all this in one cut I probably could if it was sitting in a proper call it. So I, I increase this to two passes here, 30,000 step. The default value uh, that it chose for my 60 thousandths was four passes at 15 thousandths per pass. So I left that alone. And then the last facet, it just cuts it. So this facet two is the secondary relief, if you will. And this uh, facet one is the cutting edge of the tool. And so that's all the only change I made here in the probing I, I decided I wanted to probe the diameter I don't really need to do that for regrinding but and then the lead and you know the lead helix and the flute depth so it, it establishes this uh, depth of the flute and the division of the tool the taper there is no taper I didn't probe that and the side clearance of the main cutting edge I wasn't interested in that either so these are the probing cycles you'll see run when it, when it um, probes it. You can go in here and adjust a lot of settings for probing, but I just leave the default values uh, on here as well. So you can, you can probe this here, which is what I did to make the video actually, just probe it, or you can, and then grind it, or you can probe and grind it which is what I normally do. When I put a tool in there, if I'm grinding a number of tools like I am here, I just select this and it'll, um, and it'll start processing this. And then you'll see it comes up here, you just push cycle start and it'll run the probing cycle first and then it'll run the grinding cycle. Well, it actually stops, it dwells. After it probes it, it dwells and then you gotta push start again to run the grinding part of it. So that's that's all there is to the actual uh, running of the machine here. So let me move the camera over here and you can kind of see what happens.
now it'll um, it'll send the data. It's sending the data. It 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 measured over to the control of the machine, and then it's going to do the uh, grinding. But I'm going to have to close the door for this. Okay, so this this is the actual grinding of the tool, but you really you really can't see too much that happens here because all of the the coolant or the oil and everything you see it's kind of like looking through the door is kind of I don't know maybe I can get a put some light down here somehow so you can kind of see what's happening so it's not really a uh, I can't really put the tool, the camera in there, of course. I don't know if I can move this light around. Maybe you could see it a little better. So anyway, we're gonna take a look at it when it finishes, because you really can't see anything here. Okay, it's almost done with the, we're at about six and, almost seven minutes now on the cycle. 6.57. So then it's going to move that back, come back in and do the, and it rotated the B axis a little bit. I don't, you probably couldn't see it, but, and this is grinding the uh, cutting edge relief, if you will. That was the first one and now the second one. That's it right there. So let me, um, let me see if I can move the camera down and we'll take a look at what this did. So that's pretty much all there is to it. Not really too hard, difficult to resharpen a tool. Now this, uh, when you saw the probing cycle, you saw that little, um, let me show, see if I can show it to you. We're looking at the probe. You can see this little, uh, let me get some light in here. It's really dark. You see this little point thing here? Okay, if you wonder how they, um, how they line up on tools when they grind them, like that have these coolant holes in it. You see the coolant hole right here, this coolant hole. They use that little point on the probe. The probing cycle can, can probe these. So if you had a solid blank, like a drill, I don't know if you, maybe some of you don't realize how they make these drills. Carbide is um, kind of, it's cast with this powder. It's kind of like a powder, like a sintered material, like, like you see these bronze bearings and stuff are made out of. Well, carbide's made the same way. It, they cast it in a, in a mold, but they just cast a round blank, a solid round rod. But they have these coolant holes in there. They're, um, they're wires that have these spirals already in them and they put them in the mold and then when they pull it out they rotate them as they come out and it forms the, a spiral hole through the, through the blank. It goes all the way to the back and, as a spiral. And when you buy these blanks to grind a drill, you know, to manufacture it, it's a solid blank and they center, let's ground it, grind it to the diameter of the tool and the shank and everything. And then you have to um, out at the end of the of the um, out at the end here. You can see these two holes coming out, and you have to probe them to get the helix in the right position. Otherwise, you're going to intersect the holes, of course. And uh, it it's kind of critical, of course, that you have the same helix angle that the spiral has. So they define these uh, blanks that you buy with the helix angle of the coolant holes so that when you probe it and grind it, you don't intersect one of the holes and, and uh, mess it all up, of course. So that's, that's actually how, it, so carbide is a centered material, means it's cast, and then they heat it in an oven to a very high temperature, and it, and it um, bonds all together with its, with its uh, binder 
um, material. I'm not sure. They use different kinds of materials to actually bind the carbide grains together. So they, they, it's this fine powdered material. It's cast in a mold, centered, and everything kind of melts together in the centering process. And it also shrinks a certain amount, so they have to control that. When they make carbide inserts, they have to be careful to know those values exactly so the carbide insert for a lathe turning insert comes out to the right size, or milling inserts too, because a lot of the features on those inserts aren't actually ground, they're cast in. You can see them like the chip breakers and stuff on the top of the tool and everything. And even some inserts on the cutting edges aren't even uh, ground, they're just as cast. So you have to, uh, you have to make sure you know the shrinkage precisely, which they do. So they, they center it, they, and then, they, then it already has the holes in it, and so when I get the blank to grind it, if I do that, and I've done it before, you probe the, uh, the coolant holes with this little needle thing that sticks out of the probe right here. And it's, and it's all calibrated against this, um, if you calibrate the, the tool probe, I don't know if you can see this, let me get closer. This little block here is in a precisely known position and you the machine has a calibration cycle and it comes up here and it calibrates that um, that probing sty uh, stylus, if you will, for the appropriate dimensions so that it knows where it is. So when it probes a tool, everything is precise. Now there's different kinds of probing tips that you can put on this. I just have I just have this one, which which will really only probe right-hand tools. But if you want to probe left-hand tools, you, you they have they make kind of a double-sided one of these to probe right and left-hand tools, which I, I don't have on here because I, I don't I can't even remember if I've ever made a left-hand tool before. I mean, if you some tools have right and left-hand cutting edges like these uh, up and down uh, router bits and stuff like that, but uh, I've never really done any grinding like that. Otherwise, I'd have to get the appropriate tip for my probe here, and then, then I could calibrate it on this uh, this block here. Actually, the way you you initially calibrate everything on this, there's a little sphere. I don't know if you can see it right here, and you have to precisely define the location of this sphere, and it knows in relation in relation to this probe over here, so we can actually set and this probe for the grinding wheel so it can set the dimensions of everything when it probes it properly. I don't know, that's just a little information on this machine itself. Doesn't have to do with totally with grinding the tool. But anyway, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I only have three of this size drill to grind and, and uh, that's, this is the last one. So I thought that might be interesting to see and how really how simple it is on a grinder like this to actually sharpen a tool like this and do it very precisely. So thanks for watching.